Hi, I'm Rob Dom, and this is my all-wheel drive four-rotor RX-7. This car is very special to me for more than what you see here. In fact, actually the color itself means a lot, but I bought this car when I turned 18, financed the crap out of it, and it was actually a chance to see my grandfather for the last time as I drove cross country to go pick the car up. And so the car, what started as the car, uh, was very, very special to me. And it started out its life as a stock twin turbo FD. And then I got the bug. You know, I, I added a wideband controller, I added a front mount intercooler, a cap back exhaust. I was just in learning what it took to modify a car to make a little bit more power. And then that just downward spiraled to what you see here. I've gone in phases where it was like, okay, I'm gonna do a single turbo upgrade. And I did that and then I realized that it was a very laggy turbo. So then I ruined all of my performance that I loved about an FD, the, the twin turbos coming on so early that I actually fell out of love with the car and put it up for sale but nobody wanted it. And it was for $10,000 about 10 years ago. Nobody bought it. And nowadays, of course, that's insane because it was, it was a full FD, just single turbo. And uh, so, you know, you go in waves. And so everybody goes in waves. This car did too. And so when I, came back, when I came back to this car the last time, which was about seven years ago, I'm like, you know what? This is the, the car that I'm going to make this crazy, wild idea into. And, and I knew I was going to destroy what was the car, but I mean, it's like, Theseus ship paradox, like, you know, it, what, what is my car? Well, emotionally, this is always gonna be my very first sports car. I have two things that really inspired this journey early on, and I think are the reasons that this journey was successful. One is brotherly competition. This car came out of a simple little drag race that my brother and I had at, at a green light. He had an R35 GTR with bolt-ons, and I have which is behind it, uh, the three-rotor RX-7, the FD. And I had 250 horsepower at the wheels more than him. And I lost every time off the line. And, you know, we weren't going fast. We were just accelerating, right? And, and rear-wheel drive, tons of power, just burning out the tires. And so I realized, okay, if I can't beat him, join him. And I'm, I'm going to go all-wheel drive. Nobody does that with our, uh, nobody goes all-wheel drive with rotaries because of the apparent lack of torque to drive the entire drivetrain. And so I was like, okay, then that means I'm going to have to take it up a notch and go four rotor. And I, I'm a massive turbo fan. And so, of course, it was going to be a turbo four rotor. So the, the concept for the car was locked in back in about 2014, 2015. And I had no idea how to do that. I was not a builder, not a machinist, not a fabricator, not a tuner. Not so coincidentally, at least at this point in the journey, there was a video that came out, Gymkhana 7. And I was watching that, sitting in my home in Michigan, and I saw Ken Block drifting that all-wheel drive Mustang through the LA River. And I saw wheels articulating and power being put down, control, drifting, all the, the, the sex appeal of all that. I was like, okay, whatever that car is doing, I want that. I want, like, that, that answers how to do the all-wheel drive system. And so I made a Hail Mary pass. I, I was like, you know what? I'm gonna figure out who made the car. And there's actually a company called ASD who currently makes all the RTR Mustangs. And so the owner, Ian Stewart, is a Kiwi. He's, a, he's from New Zealand. And he used to work with Rod Millen, who was the only other person to all-wheel drive a rotary. Rod Millen had done Pikes Peak when it was dirt in an all-wheel drive FC and a, a first gen. So it couldn't have been more full circle. The, the guy I reached out to for the Hunicorn ended up being a, a big fan of rotaries. And so I told him my idea that this car could be, and I, I wasn't trying to make a drifting car. I was trying to make a grip vehicle capable of doing a lot of different things really well. And he said, you're effing crazy. I love it. And so he gave me some of the suspension geometry for the Hunicorn. I think the most important aspect of the inside of the car was to make it look like the inside of a car. It is, I think, harder to keep the stock dash. It's harder to have as much of the stock you know, door panels as possible. And so I wanted that tactile feel of using the key, of using my headlight, my, my window buttons. I wanted all of that to work. And so those are all inputs on the Nexus to control 
you know, like if I want my hazards, they, you know, those work. If left and right turn signals, reverse, uh, window switches, they all go through the Nexus so that the, the car is as OEM feeling as possible. I mean, that's, just, that's where the OEM feeling ends, but uh, that, is, that is, was something very important to me was that, you know, I, it kind of pains me to see like a, a more stock looking car um, be completely stripped interior. Like, yes, you're gaining that little fraction of weight savings, but it's just like, I, I want to put all that back in and just make more power to try and, uh, you know, compensate. So uh, it is really neat because, you know, I, I wasn't sold on the concept of, a, you know, quick, you know, disconnect, but it's been functional. I even have, you know, paddle shifters, which is weird because I have my string gauge shifter there, but I actually use this one as a uh, uh, line lock button. And so through, through the Haltech, I press and hold this button and it activates the line lock uh, circuit, which is on a little uh, eight amp circuit, but it also deactivates all wheel drive. Cause as I learned very quickly, if you, if you pull the handbrake or if you do something where you line lock the front brakes, either one front or rear brakes, if your all wheel drive is engaged, it still stops the entire drivetrain. And that was one of the most anticlimactic things. I was gonna try and drift around the, the shop in rear wheel drive. I, I had an all wheel drive on accident. I go and you know, pull the rear, the rear you know, handbrake and the whole car just comes to a stop. I was like, that was so wrong. And so again, I, I still using like the stock FD uh, uh, col steering column, my key works. And so I pull the master thing. And so if I use my key, it goes through all the sequences. And I mean, I have all wheel drive working, I have everything on. Uh, and so it's, it's as uh, OEM feeling as possible. And so I'm very, very happy with all of that. Uh, there were two or three times during this project, and the guys that follow my channel know, where the, really the car was dead in the water. And uh, I went to different shops and realized, you know what, I'm gonna have to roll up my sleeves and do it myself. And I, I think that this car stands for what a lot of people uh, appreciate in their own lives of, can I do it? You know, DIY. This is, this is like the most extreme, uh, disgusting DIY project on earth. And in fact, some of the other YouTubers reach out to me and they're like, how the hell can you make 100, 200 videos about the same car? And I have to explain, it's not about the car. The car's, no pun intended or pun intended, a vehicle for learning about suspension, for learning about tuning, for learning about you know, intercooler sizing. And so the videos aren't, aren't about the car. The car just is the perfect way of explaining those things as I learn them. YouTube's a, YouTube's a two-way communication thing, and, and most YouTubers fail to recognize that. And so when I'm building the engine uh, for the very first time, I saw a lot of negative comments. Oh, that engine will never run, and it, it ran. But I also saw people both positively and negatively giving me criticism, but both was valid. So I had somebody saying, oh, that, that moron, he's going to break it because he didn't do this. And I'm like, oh, he's actually wasting his time writing that comment out sharing a genuinely uh, useful piece of information. And so I, I, I watch the comments on YouTube all the time because there are some very smart people watching and whether they have a harder time being social uh, uh, and, and polite about it, that doesn't matter. They're, they're actually wasting their time helping me learn. And so that is, I think that's what's accelerated my learning so quickly is the people watching it. Like I have a lot of IndyCar engineers, people on race teams watching my content, and they send me messages privately, like, hey, this is how we do it on this team, and I can't give them credit, but they make me look really good. There's just so much knowledge out there. So this is where the entire project began, the control arms, the lower and upper control arms for the front of the car, and I didn't design this part, I designed the entire rest of it, but the guy that helped me cut these put my name into them, which is kind of a fun little detail there. But this is actually based off of the Hunicorn. So the length of these arms, it shares the exact same dimensions as the Hunicorn. So I thought, okay, if Ken Block can make that car dance in the LA River, this car should be able to start somewhere crazy. And then something as simple as this, which is you know, always my like last second testing and tuning, I have all four of the Corvette wheel hubs wired in, which means all the ABS sensors. So I know, I think it's every, inch and a half, there's a pulse, a, an on off, every inch and a half that the tire spins, so we can actually measure all four wheel speed sensors independently, and that helps me with all my traction control, my all wheel drive control. It's incredible how much data you can get just from one sensor on each tire. We have the carbon fiber 
axles, and the entire drivetrain is carbon fiber, and we were always testing some really new technology there, but uh, this is one of my favorite little parts. It's been working well. It's not meant to be an axle. Uh, axles aren't normally carbon fiber, and yet on this one, they are. This is actually one of the many multicultural aspects of the car, is that I used a little bit of everything that works to make this car work. So this is actually the rear differential out of a BMW E36. This being the E36 rear diff, when we put it in the front, it has a, it, it, technically it's out of a Z3M, same, same class of car. Uh, it's got a torsional, like a, a gear style uh, limited slip. And when you take and put a rear diff in the front, the gear spins backwards. So this is technically in reverse at all times. And the uh, torsion gears don't like to turn. So as soon as I went to turn for the first time, it, was a, it became a locking diff, which is actually a really good thing for racing. But uh, thankfully, Wavetrack makes a reverse gear set and uh, we can now turn. The, I think this is really, if you talk about the hardest part of this build from the beginning was making it all wheel drive because you have to get power to this up front past a rotary engine that has exhaust and intake over on this side. And initially I had this axle, or initially I had this drive shaft going between the intake and the exhaust, and then finally we were able to lower the diff, get the engine to the right height, and get it underneath the exhaust. But we have like heat shields and all that sort of stuff because that exhaust is glowing red hot every pull you make. And then, I guess, moving more to the front, you can see right here another unrelated BMW part. I have a BMW water pump out of an X6 SUV. That pump is incredible, especially when it's controlled by the Haltech because I can have the car sitting and if it's over 140 degrees, I have it pushing a lot of water through the system, even though the, the radiator or the fans aren't on. So that way we don't get any hot spots in the motor. It's always constantly distributing the heat above 140 degrees and it's, it's worked wonders. The motors expand and contract as needed and uh, I haven't seen any sort of heat related damage to the motor yet with how hard we push it. Uh, right up here, it's kind of hard to see from that angle, but you, you'll see right where my finger is. This is the center of the entire car. I don't care what anybody else says, the very center of the entire vehicle is my trigger wheel. This motor wouldn't spin without the trigger wheel, the car wouldn't go without the motor. And that piece of data is the most sacred piece of information in this entire car. All these other wires don't matter to me as much as that signal does. And so that is, that is a very important part of this entire vehicle. Also, really, right here, this is one of the prettiest parts. This is a, the uh, billet oil pan made for a dry sump oil pan. Now, dry sumps are very common in race applications for pistons, but on rotaries, it's very unknown. People don't know much about how dry sumps work on rotaries, but it sure helps with lateral, so turning side to side, sort of uh, preventing oil starvation. And I've learned a lot, uh, and I share that in my videos, on, on how to use dry sumps with rotaries. We have a real nice wasp high powered starter, a, a steel bell housing made out of billet steel, which will prevent the quad plate clutch from ever hurting me if, if I ever get too saucy with that. We have the Hollinger RD6 sequential transmission here. And oh my God, that thing uh, is worth every penny that it has cost me to get that in there. And then finally, Behind all of that is an R33 GTR transfer case. You could use R32 and R34, they're all the same. They just have slightly different controls, uh, same exact box, but uh, happens to be out of an R33. That is the magic of what makes this car so special to me and I think to the world is the combination of the turbo four rotor with a sequential six speed going to an all wheel drive transfer case. So it uses a C5 uh, hood clamp. Uh, it's what I've experienced with and I have two to prevent this hood from flying up. So I have one on this side, one on that side, and anybody that has a C5 Corvette will recognize these from the back side of the hood. Now, the, the, the first thing to point out is how sad I am that I hide this beauty underneath this, but this hood is actually made by a friend of mine, Steven Nelson, and it is a completely custom hood for this car. So the car is, I think, seven and a half inches longer from the wheel to the uh, to the whole normal FD part. And so I built two hoods, you know, I clipped them together. I actually riveted them together, cut and pasted sort of thing. And then he turned it, look at all this forged carbon. Like he, he custom made this all out of a wax to make 
the inside, the inner lattice and structure of this hood just for this car. So a uh, very custom piece just for me. And it even has four rotors. Uh, he added that, nice little bonus. Uh, only works for this car. So again, to start with where the car started with, it's, it's the suspension. And I've made quite a few mistakes, beginner's mistakes, but that is where the car started from, was getting the shocks out of the way to allow power to be put to the front wheels and, and also to make them turn really tight it helps keep everything kind of nice and, and close to, together. And you can actually see, I've put different wheels on this car and I've hit my control arms, learning how, just how far I can turn uh, left and right. And so that to me is really what starts it all. The, the, when you, when, uh, before the body was on the car, if you said, what is the car to me? It was actually these suspension points here there and, and down and to inside the wheel. That was, that was the car. Everything went back to that. And you know, nothing else mattered to me. And so it's, it's a fun uh, beginning of the project. Whenever I got confused, I just go back to that. And so the, the, obviously the elephant in the room is this torque monster. There is my half billet four rotor center of my universe. And so the motor does use a couple Mazda parts. Uh, but then, as you can tell, everything else is a little overwhelming because it's all billet or machined and welded and custom made and even the intake manifold, everything. So um, I have normal injectors like a normal rotary engine, and I actually machine those myself. In, in this shop, uh, this motor did not have standard injector ports, so I had to learn how to do, use a CNC machine well enough to machine O-rings for fuel so it didn't come spraying out and right onto the turbo. And then all of these other 16 injectors, uh, the rest of the 16 injectors on the top are for partying. So the first four idle, and then the other ones do all the rest of the craziness. Excuse me. I have a 240 amp alternator, and this is really neat because the guys that made the alternator actually machined my name on there too. I didn't ask for that, but DC Power made makes some really cool up, upgraded aftermarket uh, alternators. And just like my trigger wheel being the center of, of my engine tuning, I think having a stable voltage is such an important part of understanding your data because obviously as your voltage changes, your data changes. And so, you know, that nice 14.4, 14.6 volts when the battery is fully charged and not fluctuating gets you so much information, so much uh, more, more clear information. And, and with that, comes trying not to use all 240 amps. I use quite a bit. I actually can uh, use it if I turn everything on. You'll notice the voltage dropped about 13.8, but I have a C7 Z06 fan shroud. So that's a small fan um, adapted to this car because it's both the fan and the shroud all built into each other. And then I have two small fans uh, for an oil cooler and a second radiator. So everything being brushless reduces the current usage up front. I think this fan at peak will use like 38 amps, which is still a lot, but that's uh, moving a lot of air. And so the other major thing, which uh, it looks, even in this video, will look proportionately sized because the car is bigger, is the 94 millimeter turbo. That turbo, I promise you, everybody that comes up to the car and sees it in person realizes just how massive that is. That turbo frame was originally built for Caterpillar earth mover diesels. So it's you know, obviously been used by a lot of drag racers since, but it looks like the right size for the car. That's one of the most uh, uh, confusing things to see. It does not look like it looks like in the videos. And so uh, all the things over here are all fluids meant to support the motor. Again, dry sump. I've got power steering because it's an all-wheel drive car. I didn't want the, the front wheels pulling the steering wheel out of my hands. So power steering has been a really fascinating challenge with this car. Uh, and, I, and my goal was, based on my IndyCar influence, was to have all of my wiring be at a quality uh, worthy of a race engine. And so I actually did this entire harness. My buddy Kev did the back harness with me because of the sake of time. But like all of these are sealed. They're all epoxied. They all have these little boots connected to the connectors, so they're completely oil and, and water tight and labeled, which is a very big thing for me. I'm pat myself on the back for that one. Uh, I never think that far ahead. But I wanted to make sure that when people pull on these injectors, when you naturally, these type of connectors, you tend to accidentally pull on the wires, no matter how hard you try. And so my goal is that when you pull 
the strain goes from the, the, the heat shrink to the boot to the connector, not using the wires and the crimps. So that was, that was actually the biggest reason for making my harness nice. Uh, and then I also have it like kind of underneath everything is where all the coolant, oil, all of those lines try and run all and do weird things because uh, I just don't want them making the engine bay look so dirty. Of course, the heart of this car is probably one of the reasons it's so interesting to see and hear on video is the sound and look of a four-rotor. This is a weird engine. This is a kind of billet, it's half billet, four-rotor engine, and it shares almost nothing with the 787B, which is what most people are familiar with. Hey, the Mazda's race car, could you use parts from that? Nothing transfers. They look similar from a distance. As soon as you zoom in, the engines aren't even remotely similar. And so, unfortunately, they aren't. But this is turbocharged, and I use a 94 millimeter Garrett turbo, a G55 right now, and I make just shy, just shy of 1,400 all-wheel horsepower at elevation. And so you know, at the hub dyno, and I could, have, I could have squeezed it last little bit out, but it was for a TV show and I, I only had three runs. And so I use a TurboSmart 50 millimeter straight gate, the electronic waste gate, to control that. And while that normally would have been undersized, and this car, because of the hull tech, I can actually adjust and prepare for the boost coming in and control it. I mean, it is the, the most beautiful, if, if, if a, a tear can be shed for just watching a beautiful boost curve, that's what happens on this car every time because I can predict it. I can predict it just about ready to get out of control, and then it's just this nice linear straight line. And so my torque curve, of course, is the same. It's just nasty straight across with just shy of a thousand foot-pounds of torque, uh, from about 52 or 5400 RPM all the way up to. I have my red limb. My, le my red line right now is 9,000 because as, as soon as you start going higher, yes, rotaries can make power up there. This one did over 10,000 previously, but you just accelerate the wear. The transmission on this car is a Hollinger, Hollinger? Depends, <laughs> depends on the mood of my day, but Hollinger, Hollinger, RD6. And so that is a six-speed sequential transmission. It's got those dog teeth, so you, do, you just pull it and it engages the next gear. There's no synchros. And the best part is I have a, a, what's called a strain gauge shifter, and that's wired into the hall tech. And so as soon as I start pulling on that shifter, the ECU notices that, hey, there's some strain hey, let me cut off the ignition so the engine temporarily turns off, lets me get into the next gear without having to lift any pedals, and then boom, I'm in the next gear within less than two-tenths of a second. It can be anywhere from almost a tenth to two-tenths of a second, and my boost stays flat. No on-off, no pedal, no nothing. Throttle stays on, and so the car stays in power so much more. It used to be a second. On, on the old uh, transmission of my three-order, full second between shifts. It's incredible night and day. So that transmission is worth every penny I've spent on that. So that is the secret sauce. It looks, it looks like a bazooka, <laughs> like out of like Doom. It's like this huge bazooka of a four rotor, a turbo, a beautiful transmission, and then this transfer case in the back with this weird side thing sticking out that's you know, since powered to the front. So it's really wild drivetrain to see when it's out of the car. And then uh, you know, I have the standard drive-by wire pedal from like a C7 Corvette. Uh, my brake and clutch, my clutch is probably, oddly enough, my favorite pedal, but I don't use that often. Um, I have like a flow control valve on there, so you can actually hear it. It'll go pssst, and it, that way I can drop the clutch, but it controls how much it drops, uh, and you fine tune that based on what you want the launch to do. And uh, I'm still, still working on that one. But I, I've, I spent, uh, I think, a year and a half without putting any stickers on my buttons because I wasn't, I wasn't ready to commit to what I wanted the button to do. And I finally committed, and so I have like all of my partying on the top row, and then more of like my maintenance on the middle row, and then all of my cooling uh, on the bottom row. It's hard to talk about this car now, because I can just go and go and go. And like, I mean, something as, as obscure as like the oil pump, or the ignition system. Like right now, it's a drag racing ignition system, uses almost 80 amps. Uh, I was able to dial that back because of my IndyCar learnings, and it's still using about 50 amps, but you know, I have complete ignition, like I've just obsessed about each of these details. And you know what the coolest thing is about the community? I think that uh, I, uh, you, starting with Haltech and then kind of spreading out from there, is that you can call these companies and they will give you some sort of nugget of information and you just have to be ready to, to either write that down and research it later if you're not familiar, or you know, they, they'll, they'll often take the time to help clarify what you're learning. So for example, I called NGK 
for the spark plugs, and they were telling me all of these super obscure things about spark plug technology. And you, you realize that there are people's lives that are focused solely on the spark plug, one of many thousands of pieces of the, the car to make it work. And so there are so many people out there willing to help if you're willing to put in the energy and effort first, not waste their time. And so that's one of my favorite things about this side of the community is all the tuning, all of the resources, all of the learning. And really, it's, it's like an engineer's um, playground. Like you, you can just really deep dive into just about anything you want. Um, these seats are actually a very funny uh, <laughs> part of the whole history of this car. They're knockoff Carrera GT seats, but I was not sold them as knockoff seats. I thought they were like just OEM carbon fiber seats. I didn't know that they were even for a, a Porsche. And one of my friends works for the company that makes the original seat. And uh, I brought the car as like a show and tell to that company, not knowing that I'm bringing a knockoff seat to the original manufacturer. So uh, uh, that was a hilarious conversation uh, to be summarized. But uh, yeah, they're, I, eventually I'm gonna go to more of a spec seat, uh, but these were the only ones that could fit in the car at the time. And uh, with the way the chassis is set up, it's, it's kind of a, a cluster. And so you can't see it from this angle, but the, the entire drivetrain is actually shifted to the driver's side, I think about an inch and a half. So it's off center. And that was done for weight distribution because the turbo and everything else is on that side of the car, as well as all the all-wheel drive system. And so we wanted to balance the weight centered and have a passenger seat. And so this is a really uh, obscure fact most people don't know, but the car, was able to be built without extending the front. The problem was is that this transfer case would be about six inches further back and you wouldn't be able to have a passenger seat's butt sit in the passenger seat. You have to cut all this out. And so the decision was made to extend the car to gain a little bit more space for all of the different things, but mostly it was done to be able to ensure having a passenger in the car. That was an absolute requirement of mine. In my videos, this is one of, I think the most underrated moments is me sitting in the car. It's always dark, it's always too dark because the car is a very dark place to be. But there I am hunched over my laptop and I'm always gonna be in the software, NSP, or looking at the logs of, okay, what, what, what did I just do? You know, and, and I go back and forth between the two because th there's so much information. And especially with the number of sensors I can hook into the R5, I have so much data at my fingertips and it can be a little like a analysis paralysis. You know, like you're like, oh my God, I don't know what this information means. And over the time though, I've gotten to this point where I'm okay, I had wheel slip. Let me just focus, put the blinders on. Don't, don't look at your you know, coolant temperatures. That has nothing to do with that. And I'll, I'll focus on, okay, how do I increase power delivery in the car? And it's, it's, it's something that I don't think people get to hear in one place like this is that your journey starts with just, okay, I need to make sure my air to fuel ratios are right. Like that's, everybody thinks that that's tuning. That is tuning, I think, to 95% of people. Okay, I need air and fuel. And you realize, especially with the, the Hall Tech, especially with uh, VE tuning, that's actually one of the least uh, time consuming aspects of tuning a car. I, and you know, you can, even, you can even go over the top and paint with a broad brush of like uh, closed loop you know, tuning and still get phenomenal air to fuel ratios. But, there's so much more to tune and to adjust. And uh, I think it's a maturity thing for me is I started out, okay, I need to make tons of power. So get the right air fuel ratio, get tons of boost pressure, and then blow up your motor and then do it again. <laughs> but you know, make tons of power. But, but as I've matured, now I'm looking at the finer details. Okay, how do I apply that power? Not just, oh, I made, man, I made a thousand horsepower at the top end of the, the, the dyno graph, but let me make a thousand horsepower all the way across the dyno graph, more power under the curve. And like, there's these layers, I think, of like, I think I'm gonna make a video someday about the, the layers of maturing as a, as, a, as a DIY tuner. And so right now, it's a lot about traction. How do, I, how do I use these tires as much as possible, both straight line and turning? And I think straight line's honestly infinitely easier. That's, that's where I kind of come from. Uh, turning is a whole world, um, a whole demon uh, <laughs> hidden inside of this car and devil in the details there. But again, with good data, consistency, and I, I think another unsung hero of the R5 is the, for me, it's an hour long logs, internal logs. Everything, every single field that I could imagine is being logged at all times. So I like, turn the key on right now, fire up the car, let it idle. I hear, I hear it idling a little weird, I'll grab the laptop, 
and I can I guarantee the logs in there, and away I go. And so trusting the, the computer that well uh, makes my life much easier. Because at the end of the day, I'm not a tuner. I'm not a builder. I'm an entertainer. Like, really, my, my job is to speak to the camera and, and entertain. That's, that's my income. But my income is zero unless these cars run and, they, and they're built and they're tuned. So it's this weird like, juggle of like, OK, I, I think of myself as this. This is me. But you know, at the end of the day, we have to make videos. So uh, it can be very frustrating uh, and challenging because I'll be sitting here going, OK, why did, why did the E-gate open there? Or why did my front tires do this? And then Joel's like, hey, what, give me an update. And I'm like, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know. And then all of a sudden, I'll figure it out, and I'll forget to tell people on camera, oh, here's what I did. Look, look at this. So uh, it's, it's, I just want people to know that you know, when I'm sitting at the computer, we edit, I want to say 95% of that out because it looks the same. I'm just, I just look at this for about three hours. <laughs> and then the car starts doing something different. And so uh, I, w I think as we go on, we'll, we'll, we'll film more about that. But it's a neat journey. It's just the tuner, just the tuning aspect of the car. Uh, oh my God, it, it's, it, it's my dream. Honestly, I, I love it. Cause like, okay, the engine runs. Now I make it do what we want it to do.